I'm with Crystal Letchard and we're here in Betsaho. Crystal, are you from here originally? No, I'm originally from the Netherlands, from Holland. And uh, why did you come here to the Holy Land? The first time I came here was in 2005 or 6, and that was because in Holland I met a group of Israeli activists against the wall. That was when just they were starting to build the wall, and they were called the anarchists against the wall. And they inspired me to come here, and I spent two weeks, and I spent them all in Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, Nazareth, Haifa, all the Israeli places. And after I returned to Holland, I said, I'm so interested to know more about the Palestinian side of the story, but I haven't been there, so how do I go back? And I found on the internet the Young Men Christian Association, the YMCA. They were doing a program of olive picking, where you come in October, you help with the olive harvest, and in the meantime, you also learn about the situation for Palestinians who are living under a military occupation. And I said, okay, this is what I want to do. So I came back, did that program, completely fell in love with the place, the people, their hospitality, the interesting history, the sites. And uh, I decided that instead of staying for three weeks, I was going to stay until the end of my visa. So I stayed three months. And then I um, volunteered with an organization that helped in planting olive trees. And that's how I came here. And then at some point in that coming and going, I met my husband. So you liked it so much you actually married a Palestinian? Yeah, I never in my life thought that I will live abroad, that I will marry somebody outside from my own country. I was always the kind of girl that was a bit afraid of traveling. I remember we used to go to church and they used to speak about missionary work. And I was always thinking, oh God, I hope you don't have this plan for me because I don't want to live abroad. And then it just happened in this way that you go somewhere without a plan and then there is a plan for you. So I'm, uh, I'm here since 2013 we are married, so eight years already. It must have been a big change coming from Holland and living here in a country that's actually full of conflict. Yeah, especially that Holland is a country where it's pretty peaceful, pretty easy. Um, they always say that children growing up in Holland are some of the happiest children. So that was a big difference. I remember the first year when I lived here, I had a lot of nightmares and I used to dream a lot about soldiers and about guns and about shootings. And, but then at some point I realized that you can find home and peace everywhere if you find the right people to be with and if you find peace within yourself. So I now at the, this moment, I struggle sometimes more with the fact that I don't have my bike here and I don't have some of the same lifestyle but you also get used to conflict I don't know how to explain that but you just you incorporate it and you are you know what what you can expect yeah is it difficult bringing up children in an area of conflict trying to keep them away from the the negativity and the indoctrinizational side yeah, it is. My children are five and seven years old and they have been starting to ask questions since they were about three years old, especially because we live on the Israeli side of the wall, but our we have a bar and a cafe in Bethlehem and that is on the other side of the wall. So we have to cross checkpoints every day also to school because their school is also on the Palestinian side. And they ask when we come to the checkpoint, the Israeli soldiers, they will stop cars in front of us with Palestinians in it, who are the ones that are allowed to cross. Those are the ones that live in Jerusalem. They can cross the checkpoint, but they don't stop our car because the soldiers looking at us, they think, oh, they're white people. They must be Israeli settlers living in the West Bank. So they ask me this, like, what, why are they stopping that car and why they are not stopping our car? So I've had to tell them what's going on here but in a simplified way so you know i made up a story about a king who wanted to have a country for his own people and the people who already lived there he didn't want them in his country so he was trying to move them out and this is how i build every time when there's more questions i build on that story and d definitely we don't want to teach our children hatred but my daughter already, she's very afraid of soldiers. And even when we are in Jerusalem and we go to the playground, she would sometimes say, oh, mom, let's not play there. These are Israelis. Maybe they have weapons. Mm. So it's not something that we are teaching them. It's something that they see and that as children, they incorporate also.
because it's the reality. Is it easy crossing from the Israeli side into the Palestinian side? So for us, it is not that difficult because there are uh, different types of checkpoints and there are checkpoints that are on roads that lead towards the Israeli settlements. And if we take those checkpoints, they, they think that we are settlers, so they let us pass easily. For my husband, for example, it's different because on, what happens on the checkpoints is racial profiling. So they see my husband who has a darker skin and who looks more like Arab. So they will stop him and they will ask him and he will have to show his identity card. Then they will see that he is allowed to cross. And my children, they notice also this, that when we are with mom, we can cross the checkpoint easily. When we are with dad, they stop us. So we have had to talk about white privilege also here. Now, you just started Stories from Palestine. Tell us a bit about that. Stories from Palestine is a podcast that has a new episode every Monday and I started it in August because I'm studying the tour guide program at the Bethlehem Bible College. It's a two years program and that would give me uh, eventually the license to be a tour guide here. And of course last year we were hit by this pandemic and then all tourism stopped and there was nobody to practice with. And I also realize that I have a lot of students who are studying with me, Palestinians, who do not have the experience of making what you learn as facts and details into a story. And I worked as a tour guide for a long time. I have this experience and I'm actually also teaching them the ethics of tour guiding and the practical aspects of tour guiding. So what I started doing is that I started recording from what we were learning little stories and sharing it with them on WhatsApp. And at some point I thought, wouldn't it be nice to share these stories with a larger audience? And then I started looking into podcasting. And since August, I produce weekly a podcast that would be related to something historical, something about the cultural heritage, could be music or sports or things that are happening in Palestine, so that all those people who cannot come as tourists to visit Palestine at the moment can still have sort of a virtual tour. Mm -hmm. wow. And uh, what sort of people do you interview? I've had a very different people that I've talked to. For example, people who are knowledgeable about a certain subject or about a certain place. The most recent episode was about Jaffa, for example, and I had a history teacher from Jaffa, and he's also a tour guide. But I've also had somebody who knows everything about the olive culture and the olive trees. And then somebody who set up the Right to Movement, which is a sports group. I talked to musicians about their instruments, the nai and the, the out, for example, and the kanun. And then they talk about the instruments and you also hear the instruments in the episode. So there is a, a lot of different people that I talk to, artists, a woman who is the founder of the Heirloom Seed Library, Vivian Sansur, and a woman who has a yoga center. So for me, it's important that it is something that inspires other people, that would make them want to come visit Palestine. And that will also give another idea about Palestinians, because so often we hear about Palestinians only in a negative context, in a context of war, of conflict, of killing, of mourning. But there is life here. There are people here with hobbies, people with knowledge, people with understanding. And these often don't get a platform. So did you start this during the coronavirus? I started it because of the situation with the coronavirus, because there was no tourism and there was nobody to receive. And uh, we, we were with all this time in our hands. So yeah, last summer. Are you recording a history of life here today in the Holy Land? I think if you would listen to all the episodes, you would definitely have an overview of the history. But we're so we're basically sometimes tuning into the Stone Age, <laughs> going back to the time when people started living here in caves, which is, by the way, one of my obsessions about Palestine is how every story, and we're especially when we also think about biblical stories, are related to caves. Because you have to imagine, the first people who came and lived here, they found ready-made homes in these limestone caves. So the story of the birth of Jesus in a cave, the house of Mary in Nazareth in a cave. Jesus was buried in a cave, and the Holy Sepulchre is built on the cave. And so I have tons of stories that are 
related on uh, to caves. And this is from uh, from two, two, three, four thousand years ago until today, how people live today. Wow. Have you interviewed some amazing people? Yeah, actually, I feel that everybody that I interview is amazing or has an amazing story. I think the most famous person I managed to interview was a Palestinian-American comedian. His name is Amr Zahir, and a lot of people tune in to him because he's really funny, and in the same time, he has something important to say. So maybe it was the fourth episode, and I just took this courage to write to him and say, can I do an interview with you? I didn't think he would say yes, and then he did. Uh, so that was really, for me, maybe the most exciting moment. But otherwise, I think that all the people I speak to, they have a really good message. I think Palestinians generally, because of the situation they live in, under military occupation, with a lot of restrictions, no freedom of movement, but they are so resilient. And I've never heard a Palestinian saying anything negative or that they are drowning in their misery. They're always picking themselves up and thinking of ways, being creative, being flexible. So, yeah, I can see that in all my guests. Mm. Uh, have you gotten any stories about the coronavirus and how it's affected the people here? Yeah, I think that in every interview that we've done, there almost every interview, there has been something related to the how people had to adapt again to that situation. So when we talk, for example, about the, the yoga center, they've had to close because they couldn't possibly do the yoga practices. And then she told us that she started to work also on an application to have yoga and meditation for Palestinians in Arabic, uh, in an, uh, an application that you can download in your phone. So we see that a lot of the people have, as people all around the world, have had to adapt uh, the right to movement. They used to have this yearly marathon in March where people from all over the world came and run with a message, which is that in Palestine, you cannot run a marathon, the normal 42K distance in Bethlehem, because you will always at some point hit the wall, a checkpoint, a bypass road is only for Israeli uh, settlers. So they've had to do the same stretch of 21K twice. And this is a story that people always wanted to bring out to the world, that we do not have the freedom of movement. And this year also coronavirus, no, it wasn't possible to do it. But what they actually did was that they had a lot of people from all over the world joining in an event where they would run together, uh, not together physically, but everybody would run a certain distance and then all calculated together, the distance would be the distance of the wall. The wall that Israel built is about 720, 30 kilometers long. So they did, everybody did a part of that distance. Again, it is a very good way to create awareness. Uh, who is your audience for the stories from Palestine? I've noticed that in my audience, I have definitely people who know me, who've been here before and who miss Palestine, and they are listening to the stories and remembering things that they saw and done here. And then there are people who tune in because they are Palestinians themselves and they live in the diaspora. Their family has had to leave in 1948 when the state of Israel was created and they were made refugees. And so we are talking about third generation sometimes. They want to reconnect to the country of their parents. And I even have a man who, who wrote me an email and told me that I am a religious Jew and I'm a Zionist. I come from a different narrative than you, but I'm listening to your stories with much interest because I'm open to learn about the other narrative. So that was something interesting for me, that there is actually a Zionist listening to my podcast, trying to understand what Palestinians are going through. Mm, wow. When people listen, can they get a deeper understanding of the Palestinian life, culture and history? Yeah, that's absolutely what I'm trying to do. And I think that they will understand more about the history in the history episodes and they will understand more about the daily life when they listen to the other episodes. That's why I'm trying to always mingle that and not to have it only about history or only about today. So absolutely, if you listen every week on Monday, there is a new episode. You can understand so much about Palestine and there is never, I've, I'm not running short of topics. There is so much to learn about this country because we are talking about the history that goes back 
to at least three, four thousand years before Christ that we know the written history. And from before that, there are archaeological findings. And so many people have crossed this area. It, th this area is the land bridge between Europe, between the Asian continent and the African continent. It was always important for every empire to control this region. So we've seen empires coming and going, coming and going, different rulers. But the people who live here, the native people of Palestine, who call themselves Palestinians, they are the ones who carry that long tradition with them. Why do you do what you do? I do it because I love talking about Palestine, because I love this country and I love the hospitality of the people. Generally, I love talking because I am a tour guide. I was a tour guide before I started studying here. And, uh, and I think that it is the, a, a great way to share your own knowledge and to inspire other people. What's your hope for the future for the program? For the podcast, I really hope that I will reach more and more people and so that I will create a certain awareness and then inform people better about Palestine. I feel there is a disbalance in what people know about Palestinians. And I hope that a lot of people will be inspired at some point when the world opens up again to come and visit because Palestinians deserve tourism just as much as Israelis do. And what happens now often is people visit and they pay their money to the Israeli tour operators. They stay on the Israeli side. They sleep in Israeli hotels. While Palestinians, they have hotels and they have very good tour guides and they have a lot of things to offer. So I want people to feel comfortable to come and I want them to come and stay for a few days. And it's safe to come as well, isn't it? It's very safe. I think the only people who are not safe here are the people who are under the occupation, who are the Palestinians. But for a foreign person, there is nothing to worry about. What's your website address for people who'd like to listen to your podcast? So the podcast is available on almost all podcast players. You just go to the iTunes, the Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts or Spotify and you go to Stories from Palestine and you find it. But the website is storiesfrompalestine.info. Okay, Crystal, thank you much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for taking the time.